and you make your way back and you consciously sit place yourself on the throne you know as the hero or as the as the jedi you know resurrected um and that story is is yoga hello 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 dharma talk listeners and welcome back or welcome for the first time to you first time listeners this is episode number 25 and i'm your host henry winslow you just heard a little sound bite of my interview this week with Isak Garcia, founder of Jedi Fight Club and the E84 teacher trainings. You'll hear all about that in our conversation. But first, I just want to kind of point out that I keep having these serendipitous um, moments of timing. You know, I interview each of my guests well ahead of when they get published. So when something happens the week of the episode airing, it's always a little bit funny. And this week, I actually just passed through Boulder, Colorado, uh, which is the home base of ESOC. And I couldn't have planned that. It was just serendipity. But I'll just take that as a signal that this is the right time for you to hear this interview. Now, Isak is one of these guys that's been in the Bikram yoga world and the tangential world related to that community for a long time. So we do talk about that, but we talk about some other things too. And I we, we cover some of his um, more surprising details of his background story. And that's kind of how this interview kicks off. We talk about how his personal experience, was, which blends Egyptian spiritual teachings and Ivy League political studies education and some time practicing Brazilian capoeira down there in South America and how all of those things melded to inform his approach to the path of yoga. He also shares a very pragmatic, practical approach to spiritual work that includes a set curriculum. And I thought that was very cool. Um, And it should be informative for a lot of you out there who may think that meditation or spiritual work is intimidating or you don't know where to begin. So you can borrow that system for yourself. There'll be links in the show notes for that. We also talk about the painful process of being, quote unquote, excommunicated from the Bikram yoga community. And that was by Bikram himself, who Isak considered a mentor at the time. But we also talk about why Isak is actually grateful for that moment in hindsight. And finally, we talk about how and why Isak is demystifying a yoga asana sequence that was once deliberately hidden from the public eye and considered taboo. And as always, you can check out the website for the show notes and links to all the uh, resources and people that we mention on the interview. You can get there at henrywins.com slash DT025. So hang on tight and we'll dive right into this interview with Isak Garcia after these announcements. Yogis, as we dive into fall, I've got a whole series of events and workshops I'm excited about and I hope that you can join me for. First up is over Labor Day weekend at Lighthouse Yoga School in Brooklyn, New York. There are still a couple spots left for our immersion, which I am leading along with my friends Aviad Sasi and Jared McCann. This is a four-day intensive yoga study similar to a teacher training but compressed and without the teaching practice. Then on September 15th, I am teaching a backbending for health and joy workshop at Yoga and Fitness Herald Square. That's in Manhattan. And then in November, I've got two back-to-back weekends of workshops in Richmond, Virginia. One at the Yoga Dojo and then again at Bikram Yoga Richmond along with my wife, Veronica. So if any of those appeal to you, I hope our schedules line up. You can check out the event details at henrywins.com slash events. What's your purpose? What's your vision? What mark will you leave on this planet long after you're gone? I'm Henry Winslow, and you're listening to Dharma Talk, the only podcast where I interview inspirational yogis on how they're changing the world in their own unique ways. Whether you're still searching for your purpose or already walking the path, I hope these stories get you excited to live your Dharma. Hello, Dharma Talk community, and welcome back to another episode. Today, my guest is Isak Garcia. 
Isak has been practicing hot yoga for 25 years. He's the creator of the Jedi Fight Club and the E84 yoga training programs. He studied political philosophy at Yale University and for the past 12 years has been a student of Egyptian spiritual teaching with the Institute of Ancient Mysteries. Isak was a founding board member of USA Yoga and the IYSF, that's the International Yoga Sport Federation uh, Yoga Sports Leagues, and since 1994, his family has owned and operated a hot yoga studio in Boulder, Colorado, where he resides. Isak, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. How's it going? Hey, great. Thanks for inviting me, and um, yeah, just just uh, looking forward to what unfolds here, having a chat with you, and, and uh, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Absolutely. Um, you know, Isak, we always start these interviews uh, with the same question every time. So today's going to be no different. Let's just hop right in. What does the word Dharma mean to you? And what is your Dharma as you understand it today? Okay. Um, to tell the truth, that's not really a word that um, that I use or a lot. Uh, I I first was exposed to that word through... Um, Buddhist community here, a Buddhist community here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, there's a, a community called Shambhala, Shambhala or Shambhala Buddhism, which was founded by Trungpa Rinpoche, a Tibetan teacher who who was an exile of Tibet and came here in the 60s. Um, and there's a really large um, following, um, and that that community founded the Naropa University, which is in a uh, an accredited university um, based on Buddhist teachings. And growing up, um, I, some of my friends were involved in that community. And, and so that was sort of my first exposure to that word Dharma. Um, and uh, I mean, I just, I understand the word to, to have, to relate to one's duty. Um, also to relate to um a sort of a body of teachings, like a, the body of teachings of the Buddha. Um, and I really understand that as, you know, I, I understand that all religions teach a, a sort of universal spirituality. Um, the, the word religion, actually, the Latin word religion, it means it, it comes from the word, two words, religare, which is to reconnect, which is what yoga is. You know, yoga being unification to bind together um, your consciousness with the higher consciousness. Um, so, so in my in my mind, Dharma, as in terms of teachings, is just the Buddha's version of of a universal spiritual teaching. Um, and in terms of my duty with that, um, you know, I feel like that means, you know, in everything that I do, I have uh, an obligation to to bring it back to life's ultimate purpose which is um self-realization or soul perception or or spirit spiritual service um in the you know physical dualistic world cool yeah how's how's that (laughs) i I like it that's a good answer and you know it's interesting that you bring up um this definition of Dharma as being a body of teachings. It's not something that um, I've talked to many guests about, but given that you are sort of a scholar of spiritual teachings from different uh, cultures, different lineages, um, I'd love to kind of dig a little deeper on that with you. I had no idea that you had been studying Egyptian spiritual teachings until, you know, you sent over your bio. So how did you get into that? And how does that integrate into what you're doing with the yoga? Um, okay. Well, the way I got into it was simple. Um, it was actually the same way I got into yoga. I met somebody who, you know, said something and I just took it from there. It wasn't something that I pursued or looked for, you know, it was just something that, that came across my path. And it, you know, as it, when it did, it was just like, that's, you know, resonates for me. And I, and, and I followed it and followed it to the next step into the next step. Um, and so the the person who I met, she she's a, a music teacher in Denver, Colorado. Who my sister is a musician, and so my sister connected with her. Her name's Natalie Oliver Atherton, um, and she, she um, you know she inspired my sister in a lot of ways, and and connected my sister to um, a teacher whose name is Isis Astartha Merku, 
or, or well, that's her spiritual name. Her her legal name or given name is Caroline Fuqua, um, and she's a teacher that I've been, um, you know, just found as the greatest source of you know spiritual inspiring teachings. Um, as far as you know, a person who I can speak to and be with, and and um, you know, she's just somebody who's who's been a great mentor for, of mine. Um, you know, since that moment I'm referring to, which was you know over 12 years ago. So that's how I came across the Egyptian stuff, and that's it, just been a rabbit hole since that. And I and I said briefly, I, I came across Bikram Yoga in the same way or Hot Yoga. Um, my sister was at the Kripalu Institute in Massachusetts. Um, and, uh, that was right before Bikram was starting to do his teacher trainings and he was a guest there. Bikram was a guest there and was talking about his teacher training coming up. And my sister started practicing hot yoga there and, and convinced my mom, you know, there's at that point to go to Bikram's training and my mom convinced me to come and take a class and, and then, you know, and then that was just sort of one thing led to the next with that one too. Mm -hmm. But, but neither of those things were, were things that I, that I pursued, you know, that was 25 years ago. It, yoga wasn't a, a really a thing popular like it is today. Um, but it was just something that, um, you know, once I tried it, I, I, I really liked it. And I was a athlete in high school. And once I started doing yoga, you know, I, I, it really resonated for me in terms of just physical training and then, but I, you know, I, I also got into the spiritual side of it right away. Bikram, when I met Bikram the, for the first time, he gave me a copy of Autobiography of a Yogi, um, pretty much on our first meeting. And, um, you know, so I was exposed to Yogananda's teachings. And, and like I said, I had friends that were part of a Buddhist community growing up. And so, and so um, anyways, it, all the pieces just sort of fell together that way for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it I can definitely relate to this idea of not pursuing the things that end up being big parts of your life, right? I mean, they, they come across your path as impressions, but really that's how almost anything meaningful happens. If you have a preconceived notion of where you're going, it's, it's often more limiting than opportunistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. And so that the other part of my question um, that I kind of want to circle back to is, have you found a way to integrate these things? Or, or are they just separate, distinct interests and pursuits of yours, the, the Egyptian spiritual teachings and the yoga? Um, it, doesn't seem, it doesn't seem at all s separate in any way in my mind. I mean, it, it seems very much, um, uh, you know, the same, the same subject. Like I said a moment ago, mm -hmm. you know, in my mind – um, yoga is another word for a universal spiritual uh, dharma, really, it's body of teachings, um, you know, expressed through a certain culture and, you know, a Sanskrit language as the word yoga, you know, expressed through a Latin language as the word religion, um, you know, and, and, I'm, and that's, that's referring to the body of teachings, not the institutions um, that carry those body of teachings, but you know, all cultures of all times have have had um, a, a way of, you know, teaching about spirit and teaching about um, humanity's ultimate purpose, spiritual purpose, um, or at least philosophizing about it or, or searching for it or reflecting. Um, so, you know, in my mind, the, the, the yoga, the, the physical practice and the, and the sort of spiritual pursuit it, um, is linked, although although I I do see that it can be very separated, um, you know, in the way that it's presented in sort of, you know, American culture, Western culture, pop culture, has you know yoga as as sort of this activity that we do, mm -hmm. rather than um, a, a state of being that we can in, that we can embody, and, and not not necessarily embody with our bodies, but you know, embody with our minds, with our beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Maybe there's a new word needed there in, in being <laughs> instead of in body. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's a bit tricky to, to navigate the, the semantics there. But, you know, with the, the physical versus the more all encompassing idea of yoga, on the one hand, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of um, 
it's a bit of a trap. But on the other hand, having it be physically oriented in the beginning draws a lot of people in that otherwise might not experience that deeper level of connection. Just like you said earlier, you know, you were attracted to this as, as an athlete, you know, you had mm -hmm. other background interests that ended up making it make sense. But I mean, okay. that's how it was for me too. You know, I came into yoga class looking for a physical fitness alternative, you mm -hmm. know, but it doesn't take long before you start to see something else in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, ooh, that's kind of a can of worms. If you ask me, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's the first thought that I'm having is that, um, you know, part, there's a, an ancient teaching of, you know, what, what comes through like the yoga tradition as, as, as karma, you know, cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Um, another way to think about this is, you know, you, you reap what you sow, you, you, uh, plant seeds and you get results. And, you know, this, the, the start, the seeds that you plant will always sort of determine the results that you get, you know, in the physical world. Um, and, you know, and, and similarly, I feel like in the in, internal spiritual world, it's the same. And so, and so, although I do think that, and I do see a lot of people, um, sort of come to spiritual awakenings and, you know, start, start to be, become interested in, in more balanced lifestyles and, and, um, self-reflection through a physical practice. I, I still believe that, um, that the, the interest in, in developing, blossoming spiritually must be present first in order for, to have that be the result. Totally. Does, does that make sense? Absolutely. And I agree with you 100%. So, so in other words, another way to say that is like, Nothing comes from outside in. It's not like you can you can do a physical exercise and then have a spiritual awakening. You know what I mean? It, that spiritual mm -hmm. awakening has to start inside, and yeah. then maybe the physical practice is the thing that sort of um, be, becomes a way th that you express it or the way that you you know experience it. Right, right. So, Isak, what is your personal yoga practice looking like these days? I mean, I know that you have a very um, intensive physical practice, but I can also tell that you've got an intellectual and spiritual practice as well. What does your average um, daily practice look like, if you can even sum it up in that um, way? Well, I can, yeah. Um, I Let's see. These days, my, phys like my asana practice is... is um, a lot I spend a lot more time doing meditation actually than I do in asana practice mm -hmm. um, on a day to day uh, now that also changes when I'm doing trainings because a couple times a year I'll do um, for the last two years anyway I'll, I'll do a the e84 training which is a month-long intensive um, and then Jedi training and the the e84 completion courses are two-week courses that happen. Jedi training happens three or four times a year. The completion courses happen um, two times a year or maybe three. So there are anywhere from three to, you know, two and a half to th four, or three and a half, I don't know, months of the year where I'm, I'm doing a, a pretty intensive pra physical practice, which means, yeah. you know, two to six hours of physical practice training. Um, for that, those sections of the years. And then outside of those trainings, I'll practice, you know, maybe four times a week. And, um, and, uh, but my, but my other yoga practice is, is just the meditation, which I, I have a sort of a routine that I, that I really like and, um, which involves morning, um, reflection and meditation and, and reading and, and just, you know, uh, a moment I, I like to start my day just quiet and and still and and um you know I have a, a little a little practice that I've that I've come to um really enjoy and make a part of my my regular thing wherever I am you know I travel a lot so so mm -hmm. I've you know found a way to to carry it with me and um and uh, do my morning practice that way do you care to uh to share specifically what what it involves Specifically, well, sure. Um, I okay. So, I've been reading from uh, A Course in Miracles, uh, okay, which is a book yeah. that a channeled book. Um, so for for a long time, I'll I'll start with just a, a reading. They, it, there's 365 lessons in that book, and um, I've been reading out of that book daily 
for as long as I've been involved with the Egyptian studies, so about 12 years. Um, and that'll just sort of set the tone for, you know, um, entering the practice and then I'll, and then I'll be still for, for an hour. I'll, I'll do a seated meditation for an hour. Um, and, uh, I, I've been doing, um, some of the Yogananda correspondence course, um, in that morning practice also, whether it's, uh, in, in the Yogananda curriculum, he, he recommends that you do these energization exercises, um, and like we were talking about before, uh, those are sort of the really the foundation of what what's become hot yoga in the modern world. Um, so he recommends to do those energization exercises before meditation. So so I'll I'll you know often do some of those for about fifteen minutes and then and then um, do my seated practice. So it's you know it's a it's a little bit of energization work, uh, some reading, and then an hour of sitting. And I give myself about two hours in the morning to do that. That's really cool, and I think it's also you know inspiring for for myself personally, but also for uh, other listeners who maybe think that um, the only spiritual work that you can do is to sit and meditate or do your pranayama or your kriya or whatever the case may be. You're doing some some lead work. I mean, there's a curriculum involved with both the Course in Miracles workbook that you mentioned and the um, mm-hmm. Self Realization Fellowship Correspondence Course. That's right. So, um, so for the listeners who are interested in that, I'll, I'll drop links in the show notes if you want to take a look at that. So yeah. thanks for sharing. Yeah. 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 I, I'm, I love it a lot. You know, I love it. Um, the, you know, the, the Course in Miracles curriculum, um, it's, you know, I've, I've done the whole curriculum, you know, I do it, uh, the, the, the text, there's, um, there's a, a text that sort of gives you a theoretical foundation for the lessons and so the lessons are 365 you can do one lesson a day for a year and like i said i've been doing that for 12 years and then the text itself i'll read maybe twice a year and so it's something that i i keep cycling through um but i just feel like it's it's not the it's not it's like you can never i can never get enough of it you know it's like i there's there's not it's not like like okay i learned this and now i'm done with it it's like (laughs) Okay, well, I, you know, I inspire myself with it day to day, um, you know, and I've I've found it continuous can to be um, to continue to be inspiring. So I, you know, I keep doing it. Yeah, I'm actually going through the Course in Miracles right now, um, and it's my first cool. time going through nice. it. Nice. Um, and yeah, it's. I mean, even to go through it the first time, you see the same themes come up over yeah. and over again. It's like forgive and um, yeah. basically like don't be too hard on yourself and realize that you're still divine no matter what what's going on that's right Um, yeah but you can't be reminded of that stuff enough so i can totally see why you would want to do it just back to back year after year yeah yeah i mean i I feel like it's a day-to-day thing like you know just learn from taking straight out of the course of miracles it's like any time that you are upset about anything you have forgotten your divinity you know, you've forgotten. There's a part of there's a part of you. There's a part of me that knows everything's working, everything is in divine order, and I'm able to be really happy about that and and feel well. You know, whereas you know, whereas I can know that, but but be in a bad mood. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like yeah. if I if I if I really align myself with that, you know, it's it's like that's the really the polar opposite of being upset about something. And so as long as I'm getting upset about something or as long as I ever get upset about anything, I feel like that curriculum is relevant. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Isak, you know, I can totally see how you have brought in your sort of academic tendency and, and your uh, philosophical curiosity into all of your yoga practice. But, you know, you studied political philosophy in college. What made you decide that you wanted to fully devote yourself to the yogic path and become a yoga teacher? Again, it wasn't really something I decided to do. <laughs> it was just something I started <laughs> okay. to do on accident. Um, I, I, I think that uh, the political philosophy studies um, now reflecting, it's, I, I almost feel like political studies and yoga studies are the exact same thing except for on polar opposite sides of a spectrum. 
you know, it's like it's like polit- politics are the study of duality and, and the study of, you know, how 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 we how societies create these polarities of opinion and of and of experience. Whereas yoga unity is is about the underlying commonality of everybody's experience, whether, you know, regardless of what side of a spectrum you, you reside on. Um, so, you know, I, I did those, those political studies and, and, um, you know, even that was an accident. It's not like I had any sort of, um, family influence or something to do that. It was just what resonated for me and what, um, was interesting to me at the time. You know, I, I like studying history a lot and, um, so when I, when I left school, um, I was, I, I moved to Brazil. I lived in Brazil for three years and, um, I was doing yo- a yoga practice, uh, just because, um, you know, I had learned that and sort of taken it with me at, at the time I didn't learn uh, hot yoga in a hot yoga studio. I, I learned, I, I took my first classes from Bikram and from my mom who did his teacher training, um, but as I when I lived in school and moved to Brazil, um, I just had Bikram's um, audio cassette, and I'm 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 dating myself as mm-hmm. 25 years old, <laughs> 25 <laughs> years ago. I had this little audio cassette I I carried around, and uh, you know Bikram's book, and and I just practiced with those things. Yeah. Um, and then I started teaching in Brazil. I uh, my main passion at that time was capoeira, Brazilian martial oh, arts, and okay, capoeira. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I did, you know, I was, that was what I was really into when I was in Brazil and I was just teaching English and to make, to make a living and get by. But, um, I was doing capoeira pretty passionately at that time. And, and, um, I was doing yoga kind of in the background, uh, and some friends and roommates that I, that, that I, friends that I made in Brazil were interested in my, in the yoga I was doing. They, you know, would see me do it you know, in, whether it was in my room or in my backyard or on the beach or whatever. And they, and, and they got interested. And so I started teaching a class and, and that became, um, uh, you know, a pretty, pretty regular group of people, you know, from like up to about 20 people would cycle in and out of that class. And I wasn't a teacher at that time. I was just someone who was doing this thing and, and you start sharing it. And then, and that was actually what inspired me to go to teacher training. Uh-huh. I was like, okay, I want to, I want to uh, learn how to do this properly, and it, and it also um, it synchronized with some other cool things that were going on in my life. I had a girlfriend at the time who who was going back to uh, school. She I met her in Brazil. She was going back to the United States for school, and and um, so you know that was a good reason to come back to the United States. Like I said, I was there for three years. I came back, went to teacher training, and yeah, and one thing led to the next again. When you were teaching this group of uh, capoeira fighters, was th- were you teaching the the Bikram twenty six and two sequence? Yeah, yeah, that's, straight up. Yeah, it's like that's what you knew. That's what you were practicing. I'm just gonna show it, you know. Yep. Yeah. That that was all. That was all the yoga I knew at the time. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Um, and also, that's just like a really funny coincidence I have to mention because um, when I first was exposed to yoga, I was I took yoga classes at New York sports club. And the, t- the one other thing that I got like really excited about were the capoeira classes. I think there's oh, like cool. so- something uh, similar about just like getting into the body and, and, and feeling that movement. And there's like a lot of joy in both of those practices. So I can see yeah. how it would appeal, you know, to that group of people that you were doing capoeira with. Yeah. And then when you went sure. to the teacher training, was that in LA? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Back when headquarters was there, yeah, La Cienega, two thousand one is when I went went to training there. So then you you know you went on to to be a teacher and you were doing that for a while, um, and you've continued to keep that up. Obviously, what has there been a moment along the way where I mean I think I know the answer to this. It's sort of rhetorical, but I I'd love for you to elaborate where, you know, something got. Di- you know diverged off the path and you sort of hit a wall with where you were going with the teaching maybe you know you got confused or you just yeah things you felt like you needed to surrender to something can you tell a story about an experience like that uh just clarify the question just a, a moment when i got like discouraged with the practice is that what you're asking or potentially with the practice or or even with the teaching either one 
Okay. Um, I'd like to know what you th- what you thought I was going to answer <laughs> after I answered. <laughs> oh, well, um, I, I, I didn't have a specific um, episode or anything in mind. I just know that for everyone in life, like you always hit conflict, you know? Right, right. So the sure, answer was so yes, sure. but I don't know what it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, let me think about this. Sure. Um, y- yoga... Um, the yoga practice itself, I, I don't think I've ever sort of gotten um, gotten sort of dissuaded or discouraged within the practice. I mean, I, I think the reason that I, I have practiced for 25 years is because I, I really love the way I feel practicing and, and um, you know, just, the, you know, I, there's been moments when I've tried to dive really deeply into asana. Um, but even just doing a simple, you know, sun salutation for ten minutes um, in the in the morning. I actually just recently made a series of little videos of sun salutation and moon salutation, mm-hmm. and gods and goddesses salutation. It's little micro practices that I like to do on days that I don't do an hour practice or an hour and a half practice. Um, you know, they're similar to the energization exercises I was talking about earlier with Yogananda's mm-hmm. curriculum. Um, so that stuff. I've always wanted to do. I've never felt like, oh, this is a drag, you know, um, within the, the physical practice. I mean, there's been definitely times when, when like, I'm on a, on a discipline of, like, training, you know, like a 30-day challenge, you know, or just, like, a training for competition or something where it's been, like, really hard and a drag to, like, stay motivated. Um, mm-hmm. But over, but, you know, if I just, if I scale back a little bit in those moments and just, you know, and just keep moving in a way that feels really good. I've never been not, you know, I've never wanted to walk away from the practice in that sense, or, or even in moments when I'll take a little time off because of a travel, a trip or, you know, whatever, whatever reason I'm not doing yoga for a moment. You know, I really crave it and want to get back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as the, the see being a career yogi, you know, making a livelihood out of yoga. I feel like that's where the challenges have really come in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, is, uh, and, and I feel like it's kind of a new thing when I started doing it, it wasn't a thing. Nobody was really doing it. You know, there was Bikram and there was, there were a few gurus in, in America and in a handful of yoga studios, not like there are today. You know, there was just a, I don't even think in Boulder, which now has, you know, Boulder's a small city has 120,000 people, 130,000 maybe, um, there's got to be hundreds of studios, over a hundred stu- yoga studios there. Uh, it's yeah, kind of crazy. Wild. I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if that's true. I don't, I haven't, I don't have any, <laughs> but I'm just making that number up. No, there's a lot of yoga studios. I understand the, um, the, the point you're trying to make. And yeah, yeah I mean, you know, yoga has yeah. become wildly popular in a huge industry. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 25 years ago, I don't think there was one yoga studio in Boulder. Uh-huh. You know, my mom used to teach yoga classes in a place called Jody's Sweatshop, which is this little like, you know, aerobic studio in Boulder. Uh, aerobics was like the thing in the eighties, you know? Right, so, right. um, so now there's like, you know, all people who are really making their livelihood out of this industry, this, you know, multi million dollar industry, billion dollar industry, perhaps in America, who knows? Um, so that, I feel like that's the part that's been super challenging and, and probably the most challenging part of moment in my journey, um, was when I had a sort of a, a falling out or a divorce or a separation from Bikram. Um, and uh, the way that that happened, um, you know, it's it's not something I really talk about a lot. It's not something that um, uh, I love to bring attention to. At the same time, it's not like a secret or it's not like I, you know, have anything to hide about it. But uh, there was a time when I was uh, getting divorced um, and... Bikram sort of, you know, said publicly, very publicly, he put it in a, on his website and said, you know, Isak is is being uh, excommunicated from the Bik- Bikram church or, you know, whatever. In his words, he said, Isak's not welcome here anymore. And, and that really hurt my feelings. You know, I, I, I was really close to Bikram for a lot of years. Um, and, uh, you know, basically from the time I met him until that time, um, I was, you know, in regular communication with him and see him every couple months and, and really, um, 
you know, loved, uh, the, the learning from him. Um, and, uh, you know, when that happened, I, at first I couldn't even believe it. I was just like, that's, this is, come on, this is just Bikram shenanigans. This will wash over in a second. Um, but then I talked to him and he was just like, this is my decision. And, um, I was just like, well, okay. You know, and at that time I was like, okay, I got to do something else with my life now. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I didn't, I didn't, I stayed, I stayed with the practice and with teaching and, and, um, you know, one thing that led to the next and actually looking back on it, there's a part of it that I'm really grateful for because that happened right before, um, Bikram sort of sexual scandals and misconduct and everything really blew up and, and became public knowledge and, Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I just wasn't around. For, I wasn't around him at that moment. And, and, you know, I'll, I, I, there's, you know, there's definitely part of me that's very grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I mean, either way though, I can see how that would be a really emotional experience. Um, yeah, that was, it was, hard. that was really hard for me. And, and, and not only that, but that happened while I was getting a divorce, which wasn't easy of either. Of course. You know, that was, and that was that was what sent Bikram down the the war path in the first place. Well, I I don't believe it is. I mean, that's that was what he said publicly, but uh, you know, in my heart, I don't really feel like that was what it was. Um, uh, what do you I, think in my it was? in my heart, I, I feel like he was just being the alpha male and just being like, "This is my sandbox, and and uh, I need to be, I need to make sure it stays mine," kind of thing. Mm. I think that I I had I you know, looking back, I see that he does this with um, students of his. Once they become, I don't know, proficient or or just attain a certain level of of knowledge or skill, or he sort of you know, kicks out Tony Tony San- or recognition, whatever it is, you know. Yeah. He kicked out Tony Sanchez and then Jimmy Barkin and me and you know, I'm sure there's been other people along the way. He'll just say, okay, time for us to not have a relationship anymore. Right. And as hard as that um, is, at this point, you can sort of look at it and take it as a compliment, you know. Take yeah. it in stride. I mean, sh- sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was really, it was really hard to swallow. But, but you know, like I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm grateful that that it happened. Um, it had to happen. Right. Yes. Yeah, and you know, like it certainly you said, had to happen for for me to be able to, for me to do what I'm doing now. Exactly. I couldn't do this stuff, you know, by you know, and maintain my relationship with him because he just doesn't. There's just no really room for that. Um, Right, and, you know, I, within his organization or his school of, you know, whatever his Bikram Yoga College of India, I think. Yeah, and I, I was just about to go there. Um, so, tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing with Jedi Fight Club, and I know you've been doing that for a long time, but then also more recently with the E84 trainings. Yeah, so Jedi Fight Club um, started as, as a result of yoga competition. I the first yoga competition was in 2003. And, um, I competed in that and started training and, um, I was, I was really close with Mary Jarvis at the time. Um, and we're still very close. Uh, but you know, I, I was living in, in California and training with her, you know, regularly, daily, whatnot. Um, and, uh, so I, I entered that first competition and Mary coached me up and, um, I won that competition in 2005, a couple years later and just the training I did between 2000, you know, uh, 2002 is really when I started training in 2005, and then beyond that, 2006, 7, 8, I I think after the I won the competition is when like my deepest training really happened, um, and uh, at that at that point I just sort of um, started to train with people who were close to me. Johnny Mock was you know is remains a really good friend of mine but we were really close at the time and he won the competition in 2006 mm-hmm. um and so we were training together a lot and um and it just kind of Jedi Fight Club started as just a thing where it's like hey I'm training you know who's who can keep up you know like who's training <laughs> yeah. with me yeah and and at first it was a handful of people and and um and then I started to sort of make formal invitations like hey from this date to this date it's on, you know, and invite people to come and a dozen people will show up and, and that's how Jedi, Jedi Fight Club started. Um, and the name sort of came about, it was given to me by, um, one of the participants, um, a good friend named Jude's, uh, she, she first, she created a Facebook group called Backbend Club so that we could share our photos. And then, um, and then she was like, you know, this, this thing needs a a name that's a little more fierce than Backbend Club. So (laughs) yeah. 
she came up with Jedi Fight Club, and and then uh, at first it was just a joke, and you know we laughed about it, but it kind of stuck. So no, so, no legal battles have become a, as a result. Well, of you that. know, I think if if I ever get sued by Disney, who now owns the word Jedi, you know, it, it was Lucas. I, I did a little research about this because I wanted to trademark it. I wanted to register yeah, it and sure. own the name Jedi Fight. But I couldn't because the name, the word Jedi was owned by George Lucas at the time. He's since right. sold it to, to Disney. So I feel like if Disney ever comes after me, then, then hey, any any publicity is good publicity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. I like that. Attitude. If I ever become enough to like to like have, to show up on Disney's radar, then that'll then be you're doing day, big things. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a little action outside uh, my my window right now. I'll just let that pass through. <laughs> so yeah, that was Jedi training. That's where that came from, and then um uh. The E84 training, um, well, for me, that, um, let's see, I started doing that 2000, uh, 2016 was the first, 17, January 2017 was the first training. Uh, we started working on it a year before that, maybe at the end of uh, 2015, started, started working on it in a formal way, like putting together the curriculum. Um, but for me, it's just been a, a culmination of... Um, you know, 20, 20 plus years of training, um, and, and finding a way to pass that on to people who want to do it. Um, the, the 84 sequence, um, I, I really love doing that sequence. It's, you know, really profound. And, and, um, a lot of people don't know that Bikram yoga or the 26 and two sequence comes from that 84. So, um, you know, and then in, uh, the hot yoga world, it's sort of been a secret and so there's sort of like this taboo that surrounds it. Like, you know, it's dangerous and you have to be a teacher and you have to do the the beginner's class first and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, prior written approval, special invitation to take the class off schedule. Yeah. Right, right all that stuff. Um, and so, you know, I think in the years since since I sort of had my divorce from, from Bikram, um, or, you know, since I sort of started walking a more independent path, mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, just realized how so much of that is, um, is, is, doesn't really serve. Um, and so, uh, you know, practicing and teaching that 84 sequence, um, you know, I, I, I don't believe that it's a dangerous sequence or it hurts people. I think that being forceful hurts people or, or yeah. practicing with poor technique hurts people. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, being able to teach that sequence in a therapeutic way that doesn't emphasize, um, postures necessarily, it emphasizes, you know, uh, it emphasizes stretches and st stretching your body and strengthening your body and following a, a technique. Um, you know, there are parts of that sequence, like a handstand scorpion and a leg breaking peacock and whatever that, um, you know, only, you know, really well-trained elite yogis will ever be able to do, but the majority of it, I'd say 90% of it, is really therapeutic for the average practitioner. Um, so, you know, that's my intention with the E84 is is to teach that sequence. Um, at, you know, it's part of the hot yoga legacy, and and to teach it and make and you know keep it relevant and, and available for people who want to do it. Right on. Yeah, I mean, I love that. I love everything about what you just said. Uh, I have to agree with you. And I think, you know, part of the reason why it had this taboo around it was purely political, if, if you ask me. I mean, the reason why it could be dangerous is if it's being taught with no real um, supervision. And that's kind of what was happening for a long time. It was like, you know, nobody's um, permitted to teach this officially, so we just do it and it's lead and nobody's really giving any cues and you're just kind of doing it and hoping for the best. And yeah, you know, that keep worked. up. No, yeah, you, keep good up. luck. <laughs> and and yeah. that worked for some people, but to be able to actually teach it in the way that you teach any other yoga asana class, I think opens up the world of possibilities to a lot more people. So I really appreciate what you're doing. That's I think right. that's great. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I completely agree with what you said. Um, okay, Isak, um, apart from getting your message out on this podcast, what are you doing today to live your Dharma? Today, um, well, uh, you know, a big part of, of my 
dharma my you know what i feel is my duty and and um and just my my passion in life um is is being a father i have uh, my 9 year old son osiris um he spends his his summers with me um and um so you know just my daily life right now really revolves around him in a big way um i really enjoy my summers with him um my work schedule sort of shifts um in the times of the year that osiris is with me um during his larger school breaks and and um so uh so i'd say definitely being a parent is a big part of my dharma mm-hmm. um right now this stage of my life um and um you know just just remaining um remaining aware and um keeping my sort of my 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 heart's eye and my mind's eye um on uh my uh let's see i guess the word that's coming to mind is integrity but but just staying you know integrous within myself um as i you know as I move through all of my, my relationships, you know, I feel like that's really where my, my Dharma, um, is expressed, you know, in my internal world. Yeah. It's like what you said about what you, what you glean out of the course of miracles. Like anytime you come across these very worldly frustrations, like, can you come back into what you already know really about yourself and and Mm -hmm. about all of us? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just a matter of being aligned with it. And so that's the, what I feel like my dharma is, is, is to keep my internal alignment. Mm-hmm. And it's constant work. <laughs> yeah, it's a moment to moment. Moment to moment, yeah. All right, well, now seems as good a time as any to move on to the final section of this interview, which I call the prana round. And this is a little bit of a, okay. a fun um, rapid fire section. I'm going to ask you six okay. questions and ask you to answer in minimum one word, maximum one sentence. Okay, okay. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> All right. In one word, why do you practice yoga? Feels good. What's your favorite yoga pose and why? I don't have one. All yoga poses are awesome. (laughs) They're all equally amazing. Okay. What's the single best cue or piece of advice you've ever received from a yoga teacher? Um, You, uh, who you are is not up to you. Oh, but who you say you are is completely your choice. I'm going to marinate on that one. Okay. Recommend one book, modern or ancient for our audience. And you've already known. Uh, it's called keys, keys to the kingdom by Caroline Fuqua keys okay. to the kingdom. Mm-hmm. All right. She's the one that you mentioned earlier. That's her legal name. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Caroline Fuqua, that's her that's her uh author, her uh her pen name, what's the word for that? Um that's her legal name, that's the name on her book, but she goes by Ezis. Okay. Um is yoga for everyone? Yes. Okay, last question. How can our audience get in touch with you and how can we support you in your dharma? Um I just want to say real quick, <laughs> yoga is for everybody, because because I I believe this is this is uh, the only purpose that life has is is reunification or unification with the higher power. Mm-hmm. Um, Joseph Campbell is a great is a great um, sort of name to drop right now because he he was a, sort of an anthropologist or mythologist who who did research academic research uh, on on cultures, um, you know, from all times of all over the world. And, and his thesis was his life's work. And his thesis was that all mythologies of all cultures of all time are always telling the same story. And it's the story of basically, um, it's like the father it's metaphorized, like in star Wars, like the father, son, you know, Luke Skywalker, you know, his father fell from grace and became Darth Vader. And Luke Skywalker has to restore the integrity of, the galaxy and 
and replace his father on the throne. That story is told over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, this is Joseph Campbell's, you know, sort of thesis of all cultures and all times because it's the only story that is relevant to the human soul. And it's the story of being separated from the higher power. You fall from integrity and you make your way back and you consciously sit, place yourself on the throne, you know, as the hero or as the, as the Jedi, you know, resurrected. Um, and that story is, is yoga. It's unification coming, you know, or religion of rebinding yourself to the higher power. So that's why I say yoga is relevant. To, it's yoga, even if people don't do physical yoga, you know, life's purpose is that, you know, restoring your, your spiritual integrity as you have a physical experience. Mm-hmm. Anyways. That's, yeah, D- didn't mean to <laughs> that, rush through I, that I, one. That, I mean, that was, that was worth elaboration. <laughs> that's the hero's journey, right? That's the hero's journey, yeah, yeah. Joseph Campbell. Okay, thanks for, uh, for doing that. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so people can get in touch with me through my website, isakgarcia.com. Um, what, what was the last question? How can people contact and how me? Can, how can we support you in your dharma? Um, you can support me in my dharma by by being by aligning yourself with by aligning yourself with your higher self in your moment to moment. You know, I feel like that's. Um, that's all I, if I can see that mirrored back in, in the people I'm around, then that's really good, uh, feedback and information for me. And, um, you know, that's what, what else, what else can I say? Or, or if you want a more practical answer, come to E84 training. <laughs> or there, you training. there you go. There <laughs> you go. Awesome. Isak, it's been such a pleasure having you on Dharma Talk. I appreciate you sharing all this interesting information and intelligence that you've gathered over 25 years of practicing, um, So thank you again. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. If you got something out of this episode, if you like Dharma Talk and want to keep it going, please do me a huge favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. I know it's not the most convenient thing to do, but it makes all the difference in getting the show out there and more visible to other people who can benefit from it. And hey, if you've got feedback or ideas or you want to get in touch with me, you can do that on Instagram at Henry Wins. Otherwise, I'll talk to you next week. And until then, keep living your dharma.